Hi everyone. Uh, welcome for the late afternoon session of the second day of the uh, summer school. Uh, I'm happy to introduce uh, Professor Karin Hahn. Uh, Karin received her BSc in computer science, but also a BA in political science many years ago and a PhD in management of information systems. And her career, I think, was on the border between technology and, and policy. Uh, she was a professor, or oh, she's still a professor at the uh, School of Information at the University of Washington. And since 2010, she's a professor at the uh, School of Government Diplomacy and Strategy at the Indisciplinary uh, Center in Herzliya in Israel. And Moreover, she's leading many social uh, and policy activities in Israel. She's a different visitor uh, at the Knesset, the Israeli parliament. She participates in many committees. Uh, she's the president of the Israel Internet Society. And she's very active about you know, the white usage of technology in Israel, privacy, freedom of information, and in general representing the the voice of the, of the people and public rights and, and needs. And we're very happy to have uh, Karin uh, you know, give a talk and then leading uh, a panel in this, uh, in this event. Thanks, Benny, for the introduction. Thanks, Ellie. Thanks, Or. Um, thank you. It, it gives me great pleasure to be here. In fact, I, I just told Or that I feel like that I'm not sure whether my talk will be, you know, something that this community can get something and be beneficial to this community, but we'll see. Um, indeed, I did my BSc uh, on computer science, but it has been a long time ago, so, so we'll see. I'm going to share with you um, my presentation, and let me just see if it works. Fantastic. Can you see, Benny, can you see? Can yes, you see? yes, I can. Fantastic. All right, so... Um, I'm going to talk about uh, using the Secret Service to fight the COVID-19 uh, and the Israeli case, in fact. I'm not going to talk a lot about contact tracing because we have a whole panel uh, going afterwards about contact tracing. I will mention it a little bit, but that's not the idea. The idea actually is to look at the behind of the scenes of what happens of what I call the sausage factory. Uh, the place where you create laws, the place where you legislate, the place where eventually um, the place that you decide what people need to do and what they don't need to do when it comes to COVID-19. And Israel has been really at the, at the upfront or at the cutting edge of a lot of the debates that have been happening in the last few months. Um, so I'll start actually with some of the technological solutions that have been um, you know, put on the table in Israel uh, we'll be talking, obviously, about the Shin Bet, the Secret Service of Israel as the solution for uh, fighting and, um, and stopping and breaking infections, uh, chains of infections. But, but I want just, you know, for a minute to look at the different initiatives that were coming up the table at those six months of the COVID-19. So we started, obviously, with the Shin Bet that will enlarge, that will We had drones being used by, you know, the police in order to identify stay-at-home suspected uh, cases. Again, I'm not putting my normative uh, thinking about it at this point yet, about what's the pros and what's the cons, but I just wanted to give you a kind of an overview of the very different kind of initiatives that we've been facing. Uh, most of them, by the way, have been uh, falling because of their cons, uh, but we have to admit that for the first time, we saw technology uh, being put at the front, at the cutting edge, without really looking at all the big risks that it brings and entails, without creating the checks and balances that you need in order to use, for example, such a technology. When you're using drone to identify uh, people who are staying at home, and you take pictures also of their neighbors, and then you, you save the data, what happens to the data? data, who has to the data, all those questions, uh, because of the corona, because of the pandemic, uh, people and decision makers didn't have the time and in many cases didn't have also the bandwidth to start asking those questions. Um, positioning su suspected coronavirus cases, uh, 
by the police. So we had the drones, but then we also had the police at one point wanted to use samples of people and positioning their location by the phone to, to locate whether they are at le at, really at home or whether they are somewhere else. So by the way, this, this initiative um, was working for a month or so, but then it fell in the legislation after a big debate in Israel about this, this topic. Um, surveying 24 seven Corona patients at hospital, we were very surprised uh, to see that um, in hospitals, uh, they are being used, uh, you know, when you have patients that are using um, webcams and microphones uh, in order to see what's going on in the room, which is totally legitimate. However, they're using it 24 seven. And patients that are more independent, that can walk and can talk, they don't have even one second or one minute uh, of privacy uh, to talk with their family, to talk with their spouses, um, even to go to the bathroom without being monitored 24 seven. After we send a letter uh, to the head, to the managers of the different hospitals in Israel, this, um, I would say practice, this malpractice stopped. But this is just one example, and I don't think that they meant to, to do harm. But again, when you are part of a, ongoing kind of pandemic that is so large by scope uh, is so you know in, uh, you know international um, it creates very interesting things and, and type of reach to the privacy of people that we can definitely um, you know fix and create kind of solutions to uh, another uh, example which was much more worrying that almost came into effect but eventually uh, failed after a big debate was developing a national system by the NSO to rate citizens. So this is an example, the reason why it's blurry because this is how they showed it to the public, but this is an example of that uh, particular system. Um, not by mistake, it reminds you the rating system of the Chinese government. And using the idea of using a rated system of citizens in the corona in, all the, in order to basically quantify how much they are risky in terms of corona might sound very nice to people who like to quantify things. But when you think about it carefully, you may find this is. I'll, I'll give, um, regarding the rating system, I'll give you a little bit of background about myself. Uh, which was appointed by Benny, but I was the head of the subcommittee of the National uh, Committee for Artificial Intelligence and Ethics and, and, and uh, Regulations last year that was working. And part of the work of that um, committee was to try to understand the different kind of risks and uh, benefits and how Israel can be uh, the leader, one of the leaders at the topic of artificial intelligence. When we submitted our, um, our report, we paid a careful attention to AI systems that are working specifically with mass social groups. And I, I want you to think kind of like about the, the rating system, the, you know, all the idea of you, you rate people, but then you're not interested in the people, the individual right and that idea of the COVID-19 so pay attention like think imagine to yourself who are the people who are going to have a low score of COVID-19 risk and who are the people who are going to have high score of COVID-19 uh, you know risk and in Israel it's very easy to kind of map those types of people for example we know that uh, corona rate in areas that has high populations of Arab populations and ultra-Orthodox population have the tendency uh, to have a higher rate of corona, of COVID-19 cases. That means if we're taking this into our system, that means that anybody that lives in that particular city has a higher rate of being risky out of the NSO kind of social rating system. Uh, in fact, when you think about AI entering into social systems and rating, except the privacy risk that we, we kind of understand immediately, 
there are different things that we have to take. The biases of the systems are really high. For example, uh, as I said, the input reflects inequality that already exists in society. So let's say that I'm an ultra-Orthodox living in a particular society that has a high level of COVID cases um, probability. Automatically, I'll be put as if I'm automatically uh, will get uh, this high rate, which means that people that will see me with this high uh, score will be will pay attention and, and will be very careful from what, talking to me. In a, in a way, it creates a kind of a social ban on people that has a high score. Also know that AI systems become very much increasingly uh, used, and that means that the impact of those biases impact the larger society. And I'm not talking yet about the, all the faults and errors that we put in the system or the system that is a learning system uh, learns by itself and creates basically an impact that is totally biased. So all of these things, uh, just to give you some example of how AI systems that work with societies may create uh, biases, and you probably know some of it, but this is a system of higher view. It's an artificial uh, intelligence based system. And what it does is uh, it asks you to give a 50 seconds of a video. It takes, you know, it, it looks at and, and identifies all the different points of those videos. In fact, it looks at 25,000 indicators. And if you, and you get, of course, a score, uh, 10 to 1. Oh. And you're in the 10 number score, then you're invited for, um, for an interview. This is not yet getting the job, this is just an interview. Well, they found out that there are two types of population that falls and have a bias in the system. One is uh, women, and the second one was people with disabilities. Because people with disabilities tend to look and shade their head and eyes, you know, look lower, smile less, or do things that I would say the regular uh, society doesn't do so that the artificial intelligence learns it very differently. So we know those biases, but when it comes to pandemics, when it comes to social rating, those systems have to be very, very carefully used, uh, if at all. Um, and we know also the error scope of those systems. For example, the Amazon recognition, it was given all the pictures of the con in America, and of course they found out 28 uh, members of Congress as if they are, um, you know, uh, suspects of crime. What hey. I want to say in this, yes? Hey, once a minute you have some uh, audio and video issues. Oh, fantastic. So, so do me a favor, Ellie, um, whenever it happens, um, you know, just give me a sign and I may um, kind of stop for a second or two. Do you see me? Yes, I see you very well. Uh, hi, Ellie. <laughs> um, so, so, so developing the national system by the NSO was something that was very frightening to people, uh, to the civic society, and created a big debate in Israel. Uh, part of the reason was exactly what I said, the biases, but then there was another reason. Thinking about so easily kind of a corporation between a private institution like the NSO, which we know um, from, from journalist kind of reports about their harmful kind of activities into the government. And in a way, thinking about what we are moves, about our locations, and other types of things that they will need in order to create this core as part of their data suddenly. And it's totally legitimate. By the way, this initiative failed really on the last second before being operationalized. So, so it's very interesting. We had other stuff as well in Israel. Uh, before, after opening the closure, uh, the government wanted to use uh, tracking apps on malls and uh, commercial institutions. So they wanted us basically the citizen to download tracking apps. Uh, once you get into a mall, you had to basically, basically uh, type that you are inside. Um, again, this initiative fall, failed. Uh, another thing that was going on and failed as well, the civic society debate was the facial recognition for students. Um, 
the facial recognition for students basically uh, meant that students will be identified whether they're of risk of being a COVID case by uh, basically measuring different measurements uh, using facial recognition, using temperatures, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, this topic failed as well. So this got down out of the agenda and lucky we are happy that it was uh, down of the agenda. The final thing that uh, actually entered into uh, operation was the cooperation between the health ministry and my heritage in BGI. And the idea was that the tests will be uh, basically uh, used much more effectively if my heritage would use their facilities to kind of like uh, examine tests. However, uh, just to remind you, my heritage works with BGI, the Chinese. Ouch! Really, it's so bad. Uh, uh. Ellie, what do you recommend? Not sure what's going on. You see me five seconds after it happens. So I'll mark really? it five seconds before it happens, <laughs> so you'll see it in time. <laughs> you'll have to know it before it happens. So uh, perhaps without video, just audio. Maybe it's going to be better. Uh, I, I can, I'm, I'm ready to try without a video. Uh, let's try. Update me if it's, uh, it's better. Uh, so, so part of, of part of the concerns was about the cooperation between my heritage and BGI, the Chinese BGI, and the idea of what happens to our data, whether the data uh, is being transferred to BGI, and what exploitation is being used by the data. Until today, it's very untransparent uh, this topic. So, for me, to say whether this topic is being handled correctly or not correctly, but as you'll see with the Shin Bet. Oh, turn the video on, it doesn't work. It doesn't, it doesn't work. Oh my gosh. Um, in advance. I gave a talk in the morning and it was fine. <laughs> um, terribly sorry. Um, so, so, so part of, of, the, of, of, the, of the risks and, and that the, between the, the, you know, the communication and cooperation between MyHeritage and BDI are totally untransparent. And um, the fact that they are untransparent means that we, civic society and citizen, don't really know whether the data is being used and being taken care of correctly. Um, Ellie, I'm going to take out my earphones. Maybe this is, is it better without earphones? Let's see. I don't think that it will matter, but try. Okay, um, I'll take it out and hopefully we'll, we'll see it. All right, so now let's jump to our real uh, topic. So the real topic is about the Shin Bet, the use of the Shin Bet. Whoever was in Israel at that time uh, saw the Prime Minister of Israel giving a talk on Saturday evening saying that we are going to use the secret service in order to fight Corona. Of course, the day after everybody were starting talking about that, what does it mean? Are the secret service are going to survey us suddenly? At that time, going back to March, everybody were thinking that the secret service needs special measures in order to survey us. Put that on the side because we'll talk about it in a second. At that time, we were very naive about what's going on. Um, but really, um, when actually uh, six months ago, the saga started. So I want to start with three premises, three false premises uh, that, were very, that were very prominent regarding the debate about the Shin Bet. Before even starting talking about the Shin Bet and what it means, what are the risks, what are the pitfalls of using the Shin Bet. The false, uh, the, the, the false premise, the number one false premise that was there was about thinking that the impact of technology is deterministic. If we use the Shabak, if we use the Shin Bet, then we'll get a solution. And just to remind you, at the first wave of Israel, Israel did very well. So in fact, a lot of people were thinking that we did very well because of the Shin Bet use, which didn't have any correlation. Look where we are right now. 
we are one of the countries that are in the worst situation. And she has been working since July, since the second wave. So the false, the false premise, the number one false premise was about the impact of technology. And I'll talk about deterministic thinking for a second, uh, because some of you are coming from computer science, but in information science, where I come from, the idea that technology can solve problem is a very naive kind of thinking. Eventually, when we are thinking about societies, when we're thinking about groups, when we are talking about socio-technological systems, it's not enough to have technological solutions. If you don't have the, the people behind those solutions, if you don't have the right use behind those solutions, um, those solutions won't be really giving you the impact that you thought that they will give you. And in fact, technology is very complex. Technology is very complex and the people who are using it very complex and therefore usually the impact is not deterministic and we have to take it into consideration. The number two false premise was that the technology itself is going to solve all the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, today we can laugh about it because today we know how complex the situation is and how there is no one solution that fits all. We need, you know, interrogations, uh, epidemiological interrogations. We need tests. We need contact tracing, sometimes voluntary. Some countries do, does do that compulsory. We need many different measures that come under one portfolio that this is the way that we fight against COVID-19. But it's not one solution. The idea that the Shin Bet will give us the solution was very much a false premise. And the last false was that we can really ignore uh, privacy and other rights in order to deploy technology. As I said, the, when we think about the pandemic, the pandemic caught us in a very weird situation. Democracies didn't know what to do. And because they didn't know what to do, suddenly many of the usual rights that we talk about them daily that are so important in democracy became very much at the back front. It was something like that. Don't talk to me about, you know, rights. Talk to me about how I solve the pandemic. So the reason why I'm telling you about those three uh, premises, because they will kind of like escort us as we talk about the debate that was going on and about the sausage uh, factory. So let's talk about using the sheen bed. First, a little bit of background. Israel is a very special country in the sense that it entered into the pandemic three electoral systems. Uh, in fact, not only three electoral systems, we didn't have one year and a half, we didn't have an effective parliament working in place, which means that we didn't have an institution that oversight, that creates control, that creates checks and balances in what the government is doing, which is one of the roles of the parliament. The parliament in Israel is not only legislator, the parliament in Israel is an oversight institutions. And that's very important to know. Uh, the second thing is we, did, we had two uh, waves of coronavirus. In fact, we are in the second wave right now. The first one, as I said, was fantastic. We were up of the leading countries that had a lower rate compared to the population of COVID-19. However, the second wave of coronavirus caught it in surprise and created very interesting kind of debates about whether Sheen Bet tool is really effective or not. So I'm sorry for vegetarians in the audience, uh, but as I said, let's talk about the sausage factory. And the reason why we say the sausage factory about laws is because nobody really wants to see how they're being crafted. They're entering into one particular side is one thing, and they get out at another side as something else. What's fascinating for me was that we had a lot of professionals kind of you know, talking in those meetings, we sent a lot of reports, we sent a lot of letters, but eventually you saw that it didn't really matter. It was, what was matter was the power dynamics between the stakeholders that were part of the process. What was matter was the sausage factory. So I want to tell you a little bit about the sausage factory. I want to start, first of all, by telling you the kind of timeline what was going on. 
when I told you about the prime minister coming in to the basically talking about how, um, you know, everybody would uh, use the Shin Bet suddenly. Uh, it came out as a surprise to everybody. And the day after, it came as an emergency, emergency order. Now, for the people who don't live in Israel, what it means is that the government is the one that legislates, that takes out the order instead of the legislator, instead of the parliament. In other words, it means that it didn't really pass the regular phase of debates, the regular phase of meetings, the regular phase of checks and balances that needs to pass in every legislation before it comes out. Now, uh, one of my friends and colleagues, Shahar Ben Meir, and the ACLU appealed to the High Justice Court, and the High Justice Court, in fact, requested and required the government to return to the Knesset, return to the parliament in order to pass the law correctly. So discussions. By the way, it's not something that, that is um, common because the committee that was responsible for those discussions was the defense committee because it's about the secret service. And if it's the defense committee, then usually the discussions are confidential. However, the head of the committee decided that it's going to be in a very exceptional matter. It's going to be open in many cases. But you have to understand our stance suddenly as the civic society was very weak. We were totally dependent on how many open uh, discussions they will make. We were totally dependent on what kind of data they will give us. And I remind everybody, the COVID-19 is a civilian crisis and it's not a security crisis. So that was part of the problem when we against that or to give our kind of stances in many cases, you know, it was very difficult because in some cases there were confidential discussions. More than that, Corona started in Israel. So we didn't really participate in the meetings themselves. We participated in Zoom, which meant that you couldn't talk whenever you want. People gave you the permission from the committee to talk. Now, it sounds like really technical and you're probably asking yourself, what is she talking about? But the truth is that when you, you can't talk in a discussion like that, and only when the committee gives you the permission on the Zoom to talk, that makes all the civil society in a situation when they really can't really talk about what they want. They really can't explain them, their stances. In a way, it's a, it was a big act, if you want to call it this way. Um, I, I won't talk to you about the whole timeline because I want to go uh, further, but I will there was an appeal to the High Justice Court which required the Knesset not only to talk about the situation but also to enact it as a regular law. And the regular law created a lot of debates. And I have to say that. In fact, I'm very proud to say that because of our role of the civic society, suddenly they entered a lot of checks balances into the law itself. For example, in the law when they're talking about the Sheen Bet, about the Secret Service, that they need to get metadata, data about us, they're talking about technological data. Now, each one of you know what the meaning of technological data and how large this word means, right? When we're talking about metadata of the Secret Service, that can be anything. During the debates and during basically our intervention, eventually, they narrowed it only to location-based and name-based data. For example, another thing, another thing, should I'm kind of embarrassed to say, oh my gosh, I can just imagine what you hear on the other side. Um, another thing that, was, uh, that we were able to intervene is the appeal uh, system. There wasn't an appeal system. So if the Shin Bet, if the Secret Service decided that you are suspected of being in contact with the COVID case and you had to go and stay at home and be isolated at the home, um, what happens then? What, what if there is a mistake? And we had many mistakes uh, with the system of the Secret Service. Who do you turn on to? Who do you ask to change this, the, the, the conviction, the, the, the conclusion that you are part of the suspected COVID-19 contact? 
So we had a lot of cases like that, which were basically, we were able to enter those checks and balances into the system. But you have to stand. We'll talk about data in a second. The, the, all the idea of data, all the idea of using the professional, uh, basically, community in this was very, very problematic. There were three questions that were in mind uh, when using the Secret Service, because it really, if you think about it, it's the only democratic country that is using the Secret Service to basically stop infection chains. Um, so the first question was a, a question of necessity. Should the Shin Bet, the Secret Service, uh, role track suspected citizens with coronavirus? It's a big question. The second question was a question of proportionality. Does the use of the Shin Bet technology hurts privacy and other rights to a lesser extent than other alternatives? This is when we started to talk about contact tracing because the Shin Bet was basically based on GPS, on location. The contact So the idea was to replace the Shin Bet with contact tracing technology. And then the big question was, what's the benefit and burden? The burden, not necessarily from, from only economic point of view, but also socially, also democratically, by using the Shin Bet. During the discussions, there were a few false claims. But first, the number one false claim, not the premise, but false claim, is if we don't use the Shin Bet, we will all stay in closure. In other words, the Shin Bet allows us to open everybody, open the, the market, open the, the shops, open the malls, which is a big false claim, right? Um, we know that the Shin Bet is not the solitude and not the only solution of the matter. And therefore, you can't put it on a parallel level of using the Shin Bet, then you get out, not using the Shin Bet, you get but in that at the first wave. The second false claim was that for the people who were opposing the Shin Bet, if you are opposing the Shin Bet, that means that you don't care about saving lives. In fact, you're just like, you're basically allowing people to die, which is another populist claim, right? Because the people who were opposing the Shin Bet were very much concerned about lives of people but they thought that you can save lives at the same time, save also some measurements of privacy, as opposed to using a pervasive and a very strong tool like the Shin Bet tool. And the third false claim that was going on in the discussions was that the Shin Bet was the least invasive technology. Something like, what's going on here? How come the Shin Bet is the least invasive technology? And why are they claiming this? So this was something that, that we found out during the discussions. In fact, the Shin Bet was not basically collecting data in real time. It already collected data since 2002 on people in Israel on a regular basis, like the NSA, if you'd like, in America. And it can't use that data only with different kinds of checks and balances. For example, they need the authorization of a judge. However, with the coronavirus, suddenly they allowed the Shin Bet to create a small data set out of this big data set that is being collected all the time, 24 seven, with hundreds of thousands of different kinds of um, metadata. And suddenly you're creating a small database and small data set. And this data set, this is the data set that you study. Now, one of the claims that came from uh, the health ministry during one of the discussion was, of course we have to use the Shin Bet because the phone remembers better than people. And, and it was a very interesting kind of claim because um, um, what it meant is that first of all, that the secret service will remember four citizen things. Uh, that it would be compulsory and that's okay. By the way, the first wave, not only it was compulsory, but it also meant that people didn't know about the fact that the Shin Bet is searching about them. And the second thing is that, that it may be exploited later for other purposes and we won't have any possibility of doing anything. Still, we don't know how much really confirmed cases there are. So the Shin Bet is, is a very limited solution now, the question and the debate is, do we want to use that solution? 
is it a solution that we really want to use to fight COVID-19? So you probably want to ask, so problem with basically using the sheen bed. What do you care? So there are a few things that I want to talk to you about. The first thing is, first of, thing, first of all, this is a precedent in Israel. And uh, this is the first time that basically um, Israel is using the Shin Bet for civilian purposes, which brings us to the main law of the Shin Bet. The law says that the Shin Bet will be responsible on the national security. It will be responsible also on maintaining the democratic institutionalized process in Israel of the regime. Now, this is the first time, the corona, that the Shin Bet is used for civilian purposes. But the question is, is the corona is really a national security matter? And it's a question. Do you enlarge the meaning of national security to also encompass the topic of corona and COVID-19? The second thing uh, is that using the Shin Bet may be dangerous democratically because the head of the Shin Bet is hierarchically under the prime minister. Now, currently everything works well, but think to yourself for this situation where our head of Shin Bet is going to be exchanged by the end of the year, he's finishing his term, and somebody else that is less uh, with checks and balances enters into the position. Who's going to stop using or exploiting the process? And what's the oversight? Do we have enough oversight of that process? Another problem is that, as I said, there is a very limited transparency in the, in the pandemic because of the use of the shin bed. You need all the people with you in order to create national resilience. You need to believe, you need basically high level trust to, to, in order to basically get the compliance of people. When there is limited transparency, when you know that the Shinbet is doing anything and you don't need to do anything, don't worry, the Shinbet is doing it, then there is no trust in the system. There is no trust in the process. There is another thing that is the slippery slope, of course, because we have today around a thousand dead from the coronavirus. Why not using the Shin Bet to stop something else that has a higher rate of death in the future? Who will make sure that it won't be utilized again? And it, this is something that came up again and again while legislating the law. And, and the question was whether we are using a cannon to kill a fly. The, the Shin Bet Secret Service uh, uh, tool has a large error of margins because of using GPS and because of other reasons that I don't want to mention here. But the false positive and false negatives are very, very troubling. The false positive, that means that we identify people as being in contact. We put them in isolation and stay at home kind of solution. But that's a large number of people. I'll show you in a second, we're talking about 528,000 people that were put into isolation when only 22,000 people were eventually identified as confirmed with COVID-19. Make the calculation very fast, you get to around 5%. What happens? What does the market, what does the industry, what does Israel lose from economic point of view? The fact that people stay at home for two weeks for no reason. And the false negative, negative is more problematic. How much do we lose? And again, what's the differences between the Shin Bet, the Secret Service, to other things like the contact tracing? We never tried in Israel really, really the contact tracing solution. The Magenstein, which is the contact tracing solution that came to Israel, came only in a late phase. And when it came, we had also the Shabbat, so people didn't install it. We'll talk about it in a second. Let me talk to you a little bit about data. I mean, we, I'm an information scientist. So for me, data is the most important thing. When I get a, a kind of a decision, and it doesn't matter right now whether I think it's right or wrong, I want it to be based on data. What we saw with this event, because some of it was uh, less transparent, some of it was less transparent, et cetera, et cetera, is that first of all, the reports that came to the committee, which is again, the oversight committee, were very unclear. The categories were unclear. What do I mean? For example, there was a category of people who were 
um, diagnosed by, was basically located by the Sheen bat. As suspected contact with COVID-19. But there was another category of both epidemiological and contact and sheen bet uh, data of people who are suspected in contact with COVID-19. And there was an epidemiological kind of numbers. And there was other type of number. Whoever saw the number understood that it's really problematic, that the categories don't really, uh, are not standalone, and that there are a lot of overlaps. And not only overlaps, the number has been changing. We used to get numbers in the morning, but in the evening you used to get different numbers. And it's very hard to get kind of decisions when you have numbers. And also in many cases, there were multiple sources who has been giving us numbers. The health ministry was one. The Malal, the uh, National Council was another one. Uh, another institution of health, of national health was the third one. And the numbers didn't match. And then the nice thing was if you the data that they gave you, that you summed up all the categories together, you should get the number of people who are suspected or the number of people who are confirmed. The number didn't match. And there was a big kind of hassle because of that. But what really, really worried me that in many cases we didn't even have data. For example, in the Corona Committee, there were, uh, they had to take a decision of whether to close the beaches. But there was no data to confirm or to refute it, nothing. So how do you take a decision without data? That's the worst. Um, I want to uh, quote for a second uh, something that Donald Trump has said because it's very related to, to the data thing. Um, when you do testing, of course, it's, it's, it's a false kind of, when you do testing to that extent, so you're going to get more people. You're going to find more cases. So um, I said to my people, slow the testing down, please. Now, of course, uh, whoever works with statistics, this sounds really uh, funny. Uh, but, but again, the reason why I'm showing it is because we had a lot of discussions about what's the number of uh, tests, what's the number of cases no real data was really, I would say, solid, that we could really take it for fact without, you know, being kind of like hesitant about the source and the number itself. I talked to you before about decreasing trust level, and I want to give you uh, a kind of a, a figure that, that is really hot from the oven, and that's why it's in Hebrew and not in English, but you can see the, the, the direction. What you see here is the number of patients that was not located, uh, what, that was not tracked by the sheen bed or by epidemiological um, interrogation. And the reason why I show you this is because this number shows you the number of people who went to the hospital alone, the people who identified themselves as COVID confirmed on their own. See how the decrease is going on from the beginning of July to the end to the mid August. This tells you a little bit about the decreasing trust level in Israel about what's going on. The idea that the shin bed is working and we have also a contract tracing kind of app, it's really, really problematic. Another uh, decreasing trust level kind of symptoms that is very interesting to see is the number of installations and removal of the contact tracing application. Those numbers came from three days ago. So take a look at the numbers at, the, uh, at Apple and Android, at iOS and Android. Installing, eventually, uh, in iOS, you have 637K and then removing almost half, 50%. And in Android, we began with 1.8 million. The first two weeks of the first contact tracing, it wasn't a contact tracing, it was more of a GPS. The first time again, with the first app that we used, and 1 million removed it. Eventually, today, we have only 1 million people who are using it out of a population of, of 9 million people. And, and if you're looking at Hamagen 2, which is the second, this is the contact tracing that we've been so much looking forward as an alternative to the Sheen Bat, because of the low level trust, take a look of how many people are using it. 194,000 have been installing it, 173,000 remove it. We're talking about 21,000 people who are using it. Isn't it a shame? but it shows you really what's going on. 
So how much does it really cost? It's a big question. And the truth is that there was no big discussion. One day there was a meeting on the committee and the head of the committee, Zvika Hauser, was basically um, complaining that he didn't, nobody was talking about the data. Nobody was talking about how much it costs for every person in Israel to stay in home another day or stay in home in vain. Again, the false positive. But I want to give you the numbers. We have 800,000 uh, people who stayed at home from the beginning of the pandemic. That's around 10% of the population. I don't know another country, democratic country, uh, that has a such higher rate of people who stayed at home. And it's not a closure. We're talking about stay at home because of identification of um, an application or a tool. And out of them, if we're talking again about the 528,000 of the Sheen Bath, only 22,000 were confirmed. That's a 4%. That's a very low number. Do we really want to use it? How much does it, does it cost to the industry? How much does it cost to society? And can we really measure the cost of decreased trust of Shin Bet? I'll give you an example. My neighbor is a psychiatrist. One day I'm seeing him and, he, and I'm, saying, I'm, I'm telling him, I couldn't contact you today. And he said, I don't take my phone because I know the Shin Bet is basically checking me and I work with ultra orthodox population. So I don't use my phone. I come back at home and then I use it. How many people are there like that? who don't use their phones because of the Shin Bet, because of the secret services. We have protests right now, and we have uh, social movements that are happening in Jerusalem. How many people don't take their phone because of that? Who's going to measure how much it means socially from, from a democratic point of view, all those things? And can we measure the increase of confirmed cases that the tool of the Shin Bet is causing? Think about it. If I'm not taking, for example, my phone, People with the kosher uh, phone who are not taking their phone or, or for some reason they, you can't even trace them. What, what happens with them? Then that gives them, that we don't even know that they've been kind of uh, infected. And, and, and so, so part of those questions is questions that we need to ask ourselves in terms of cost and benefit. Now about suggesting an alternative, since we have a panel, I didn't, I left it only with a, one slide. Um, we were able to intervene also in the law of the Shin Bet and add a clause which says that Israel would basically try uh, to employ and deploy uh, an alternative, a contact tracing alternative. And what it means is basically that we'll be, we, we suggested that we'll be using, of course, Bluetooth and uh, privacy design base and open source, anonymized freeware and voluntarily and not compulsory. There was a big debate also about compulsory, voluntarily. I don't want Enter to it now. But the fact that we were able to enter it into the law means that, that, that we were able to do something. Unfortunately, the head of the committee was saying, okay, I have the Sheen Bed as a solution. I have alternatives of contact tracing as a solution. I have the epidemiological kind of interrogation. I'm going to use all of them because each one of them adds more kind of identification of suspected COVID-19. And it's a big question of, of whether we want to use this, 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 everything with no limits. What's the red limits? What's the red lines? Okay, I want to finalize with going back to the sausage factory. I, I want to talk when, when technology and when science meets politics. Unfortunately, I have to be honest, science and technology basically loses to politics. Politics always wins. You can't really look for kind of, uh, I would say, logic processes that, that are going on when you create the law. In fact, what you see is that the dynamics of power between the different stakeholders, civil society, the high justice court, um, the government, the committee, who are the people in the committee? All those questions, all those politics, political kind of dynamics, those are the things that eventually decide and, and kind of determine what will happen in the end, whether you will use the secret service or whether you would use contact tracing. And eventually what I learned from this process, and this is not the first process that I'm being part of it, but it was really the longest in terms of, you know, kind of like together, uh, is that there is no replacement for the oversight and control by the parliament. 
you can't allow governments basically to make the decision for the people. In democracies, you have to make sure that the, the separation of power, that there are checks and balances, that there is somebody that represents the people. Another thing that I learned, that the procedure was totally improper, in the sense that the professional that they brought, we couldn't talk. Uh, they didn't really listen to our arguments in many cases. And in many cases, the decision were not really matching any particular logic or any particular science that was behind them. Um, I think I will stop here and uh, leave you with this and I would be happy to hear questions. And I'm sorry for all the disconnection that we had with uh, my, uh, um, with my uh, laptop. Any questions on? No, that will be the right time. This will be the right time. So there's a question on the Q and A uh, tab. Wait, let me see. Yes, about the four percent by the sheen bed. How high the rate should be to be considered as good? It's a great question. Just a second, I'll answer in a second. Uh, with COVID uh, to be below 3%, 874 calls uh, to info line after notification, 26 uh, positive tests and tests because of the notification. All right, um, so, so it's a big question, right? Uh, I think the big question is, is because there are different types of questions, there is a first order question of whether do you want to use a secret service that is compulsory in a democracy. That's the first question. If you answer this question, yes, which is, I would urge you not to answer yes in a very fast way. But if you did answer yes, the second question that I would like to ask is not how much good by the sheen bed is by, but what is the alternative? What the alternative gives us? And I have to say honestly that um, the alternative right now of Hama Genstein, and thank God Oyal Ronan is here for the panel, so he will be able to give us some, some information about that. But Hamagenstein was basically uh, a bad solution. Uh, eventually, we see that it doesn't pick up. Now, it doesn't pick up because of different reasons. It doesn't pick up because the trust levels are already low, because people know that the sheen bed is still working. So why, why basically installing and having the sheen bed and an application? It must be crazy. Uh, it has different reasons why it didn't succeed. Uh, but we have to be honest with ourselves. Right now, that contact tracing is not picking up in Israel. And so, so the answer to you is, uh, it's, it's hard for me to say uh, what's the real number that needs to be there. It, I guess if it wasn't the sheen bed, if you asked me the same question, it wasn't the sheen bed, uh, I would I probably kind of like compare it to other countries. And as you said, the Swiss COVID is 3%, then, then we know we are in a good place. But, but again, it's the secret service. It's not just a regular uh, privacy uh, by design uh, application. More questions. By the way, do you hear me better now? It's, it's stopped all the, all the kind of jumps because I need to moderate a whole panel. No. It was oh, ouch, really? Oh. I'm really sorry. I, I have no idea what's going on. Uh, there's another question on the chat. Uh, the question is by Michael May. He asks, many Haredim do not use smartphones, uh, only regular phones. What do you expect them to do with them again? Oh, so it's not only Haredi, it's not only Orthodox. To help you with the question, also children. What do you do with children? Children don't walk like at the edge of five. They don't walk with a phone, right? What do you do with them? So in the discussions in the parliament, there were two solutions that came into place. One is to give them a chip that they will walk with, uh, that is uh, contact traced, tracing uh, based. And basically um, by this, we will be able to know where they are. It didn't come into effect yet. Regarding the sheen bet, the sheen bet has a big problem because um, they are able to track, by the way, kosher phones. But if you don't take a phone, for example, in Saturday, when you go to the synagogue, or if you don't take a phone like many people did because of the sheen bed, as I gave an example, 
then they are not able, of course, to trace you. Uh, so so, so the, the, it's a big problem. In Israel, the calculation is that around 85% of the population, some say 90, but it's 85. Uh, or, 85% of the population have phones, 15% don't have phones, uh, and also we have children to take into consideration, as, as you said, ultra-orthodox. We have a problem with ultra-orthodox in that sense. Oh, I have another thing. Did you ask about ultra-orthodox because of the contact tracing, not because of the sheen bed? I'm wondering if you did, then as I said, part of the solution for contact tracing is to give them a, a chip that they can walk with. Uh, that will replace a contact tracing because they can't install in their app uh, because it's not a smartphone. Um. Okay, I think we're pretty close to the no, to the time of the panel. Fantastic. And then I, I, I got a technical suggestion for one of the yes, you know, do you want listeners. To go out and return? Yeah, you, maybe you should re uh, reboot your computer and yeah. Okay. I guess so give me two minutes. Okay, so let's take a two-minute uh, virtual break and we'll convene when Kevin comes back. 